Uh, this is, I think this is the third or fourth conversation we've had here. And I know we've had some tough conversations over the year, obviously. And, but it's so good to see what God has done through your life, seeing you standing there with Darina and your beautiful little girl and with Ethan. It's just, it actually just brought so much joy to my heart to see what God has done in your life over the past few months and years. And just before we get into the interview, yesterday we were talking on the way to the church. You said Norfolk always feels like home. Yeah, I like that. It does. I've not lived in Norfolk since I was 10. We grew up in a village just outside Kings Lynn. My mum lives in Cromer. Uh, Hannah, my sister and her family, husband John, they're here. Becky and Neil are. Welcome. Because they've been taking Olivia to university, but Holly, my niece, and Thomas are here. So all my family are back here. Um, my, my dad's retired here. He was a vicar here, died here uh, a few years back. So this, it's weird because I've never lived here since I was 10, and yet... When I come back, it just in here somewhere. It feels says, like something's happening. It's it? home. This is home. <laughs> well, let's see what happens. And um, I think many of you, maybe some of us, the senior people like me, remember you from the Blue Peter days, the good old days. Never did get that blue badge. Um, Do you want to know how many I've got at home? About 300. 300, well. That was going to be my pension policy because you could sell them on eBay and then they, <laughs> <laughs> and then they stopped it. So that was that. They just lie in a chest now in a big bag. <laughs> there you go. I'll, I'll, let, I'll let you guys um, pester Simon Lamb. Now, um, landed a brilliant job, S Sky Sports Soccer Saturday. And um, I just want to say he's doing a fantastic... I know they were kind of... Jeff's shoes were big to fill, but you're not in those shoes. You're in your own shoes, and you are doing a fantastic job. Thank you, mate. On a Saturday. And just talk to us just quickly. There was, that's a lot of pressure. Yeah, it, it is, and I, I remember the last time we sat here two and a half years ago, and I'd said after everything that happened six years ago, the career was the last piece of the jigsaw. It felt like the last piece of the jigsaw, and for a long time, I just thought, what am I going to end up doing? I was doing bits and bobs, freelancing, but as anyone in this room who's ever freelanced will know, it's, uh, it, it's a test of anxiety because it's up and down. You have really good periods and really really sort of lean periods where not a lot happens. And it felt like this was the last thing. And then the Soccer Saturday job came up and I, I gulped when they said, we'd like you to apply for it because of the man you're replacing, Jeff Stelling. He's done it for 25 years. The program started with him, it has grown with him, and you're being asked to step in to do exactly the same job as he did for six hours every Saturday. Well, I say every Saturday, but every Premier League Saturday. But all the way through, when I'd pray with Dorina and I'd pray on my own, it was the same prayer every single time. God, is, if this is not from you, please, please close the door. And every time I prayed it, the door remained open and another interview came. I prayed again, God, if this is not... Because I'll be honest, it scared the living daylights out of me. Not just replacing him, but just the fact that you're on air for six hours. I think the Saturday I did before last, at three o'clock, 72 games kicked off at the same time. You've got sheets of papers, you've got the Scottish League 2, you've got the Scottish Championship, you've got the Conference, you've got the Premier League, the Championship, the Canaries. I was covering that extraordinary 4-4 away at Southampton the other week, and Mark McAdam, our reporter, we were going to meet every two seconds, and they were bigging up the fact that I was a Norwich fan, that I could tell by his facial expression they'd been an equaliser from Southampton. But it's enough to keep you awake at night, and it did. And I felt, God, I'm not, I don't think this is for me. But if it is from you, keep the door open. And the door remained open. And so suddenly I found myself in this amazing job that is a massive challenge. Imposter syndrome was quite big at the start and still is because of the man you're replacing. But I know deep down, because of that prayer that we kept on praying, wow. that God's put me in that position. And so I know that every Saturday that I walk into that studio and I have had a couple of weeks where the anxiety that I've suffered before was huge. I mean, Doreen will tell you about it. I left one Saturday and I was a mess ahead of the first six-hour show, absolute mess, anxiety everywhere. But I knew as I walked in, God walked before me into that studio. And it doesn't matter that it's football. It doesn't matter that it's just sport because this all matters to God. Everything that we do in our lives matters to him. And so that's the thing I hold on to. When I go back in next Saturday, when I've done it for a couple of weeks, I know that God goes before me. So it's been an incredible blessing to see how God has threaded through my life, particularly the last few years, and it's, and it's just brought this incredible restoration, but now taking me to a place that if you said to me six years ago, you'll be the host of Soccer Saturday, I'd have laughed and walked in the opposite direction. That's incredible. Um, one of the things, again, we are going to get onto the hot topic tonight, but one of the things that jumps out about you is on your social media profiles, the first thing that you say is Christian. 
and you know, in the world that you live. I think that's just, why is that so important for you to let the world know about your faith, first and foremost? Because for me, my faith, my relationship with God is the fulcrum on which my life rests. It hasn't always been like that, as we'll come on to talk about. But that is the most important relationship I have. Yes, my relationship with my wife, Doreen, is massively important. The relationship I have with Ethan, my son, and Talitha, my daughter, supremely important. But the honest truth is, we know this, they all come second to the relationship we have with God. Because from that relationship, everything else follows. And I thought, I was challenged actually at Focus a few years ago. Um, Nikki Gumbel was speaking. And it was about identity and about your why. And I thought, you know what? When you look on my social media profile, and it isn't everything, but it's one way in which people have a look at your life and what you're up to. It says on there that I'm a, I'm a dad, I'm a husband, I work at Sky Sports. It says nothing about the most important aspect of my life. So, so I thought from now on, that is the first thing I'm going to put on my profile. And I don't, you know, if that means some people unfollow me, so be it. But that is who I'm about. I don't always get it right, but that is ultimately the most important relationship in my life. So that has to come first. Really good, really good. Okay, now let's start behind the why of tonight. First of all, I like hanging out with you. <laughs> Secondly, I think um, this is an important conversation to have. We've kind of journeyed together on this over the last couple of years. Um, and Chantal and I really felt we wanted to talk about alcohol in church. Um, we've seen some of the damage it's done to Christian leaders. We've seen some of the fallout. We've seen some of the, you know, just the consequences. And so we thought it would be good to have a conversation with someone who's probably walked this journey closer than, than any of us. And, um, you know, it's going to be a fascinating, it's going to be an insightful chat tonight. We're not asking you to agree with everything that's said. We're not here to tell you what to do. Um, we're here to just talk about Simon's journey and talk about maybe ways that we can help people and um, see Christ bring them into freedom. Um, we will, we, we're going to take texts. So if you've got a text, a question for Simon, I've got my iPad here, so you can text it, and I think there's a number on the screen, or you can scan that, whatever that modern-day technology, the QR code, you can scan that and get a question over to me. And so feel free to send a question in, um, and we'll go from there. Okay, should we pray? I think we should, yeah. I think we should pray. <laughs> yeah. Do you want to pray? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll pray. I'll, I don't mind praying. Or you yeah, I, don't, pray. I don't mind. You pray. Okay. Do you want to toss a coin? That doesn't sound very spiritual, does it? Not really. Here we go. Father God, I thank you for this special church. I thank you for this group of people who gathered in the heat of mid-September. And I pray, Lord, in this conversation now, I pray for vulnerability. I pray for nobody here to feel a sense of shame but actually just for you to, in the way that you do as a loving father, you lovingly challenge people through the conversation we have. And I pray that people would leave here feeling challenged. I pray that people would leave here feeling encouraged. But above all, Lord, I pray that people would leave here knowing that whatever has happened and whatever will happen, you love them. Amen. Amen. All right. Let's, do, let's just unpack where it started. Let's talk about your relationship, your journey with alcohol from, from when you can remember. I didn't have much of a, an issue with alcohol through my teens. It was never a big thing. I think the, the closest shave I had with alcohol that I remember was when I was at public school. I went to public school because my dad got in on a free because he was a vicar. So it was a public school in Surrey. We'd moved from Norfolk by this point. And I think I was 16 at the time, and we had our yearly inter-house cross-country competition where we got taken in coaches to this awful, massive country field with lots of hills in. And a few of the lads in my year had brought a couple of quite bulky rucksacks loaded with alcohol. Now, I was quite serious about my running, but I remember getting back to the finish of the course, and these guys had disappeared, and getting back on the bus a little bit later, and they were absolutely half cut. I had quite, and I know Doreen is going to tease me about this because she always mentions it, I had a, quite a long-term girlfriend during sixth form at school. So I didn't, and it's a little bit of a regret of mine, so I felt like I missed out quite a lot of stuff. I didn't really socialize a lot. I spent my evenings with her. It was one of those sort of ages where you think it's going to last forever, you're going to get married. You're 17. It's probably not. <laughs> Sorry to pop anyone's bubble here this evening. It may last, but it may not. It may, there's one or two crushed hearts over there on the right-hand side. 
But I, I had very little interest in alcohol. It didn't really play a part in my social life. I would have a pint when I went to the pub with friends, but it would never lead to two or three, maybe have one more. I had a gap year, spent a little bit of it working voluntarily in Rotterdam in Holland. Again, no alcohol really played any part in that. And so really up until when I went to university at around about the age of 20, I had a very kind of easy come, easy go relationship with alcohol. It really played no significant part in life. Growing up in a Christian household, you know, mum and dad drank, but not a lot. I think I can remember dad having a Green King. Have you heard of Green King? We'd have, he'd have a, a pint at Christmas, occasionally have a drink of it elsewhere in the year. Mum would very occasionally have a glass of wine. So we grew up in a household where alcohol wasn't a big part. Alcohol wasn't a part of social life. But then in 1992, I go to Birmingham University and things change. And we talked offline about, you, you described it as an alcoholic bomb went off in your life. Talk about what that, because I, I know for many students, when I was at college, university, I, I, it didn't happen in my life, but it happened in a lot of my colleagues' life, this bomb exploded. Yeah, so anyone who's been to university or is, or is going or is about to, it, it's, it's, it's an amazing experience, but it's also it's quite, it's quite tricky at first, because you are probably leaving home for the first time, so you're away from that security of your family unit, you're going to be getting to know lots of people that you've never met before. You might go to university with some of your friends, but largely you tend to go somewhere where you're going to have to get to know lots of different people. And for a little bit, you're like a fish out of water. Now, I don't know if this is still the case at universities, but we had a thing at Birmingham University where I was in 1992 called Freshers' Week. And it's a week of basically getting you comfortable with university life, finding out about the university, finding out about societies, finding out about the course you're going to be doing, but getting you to socialise and getting you to mix. From what I can remember of that first week at Birmingham in 1992, every single activity in our hall of residence revolved around alcohol. Because the problem is, lots of people gathering at university don't feel very comfortable at first. They feel that kind of pang of missing home a little bit. Yes, they're excited that they've landed at university, but they're missing home a little bit. They don't know people, so there's that nervousness in social situations. And I just felt like a fish out of water. I remember distinctly the first evening in halls of residence. I was going for the cheaper options. It meant I was sharing a room. And I remember nervously looking out, because I'd been to the Christian Union the day before, so I got there early. The 10th floor of this tower block in Birmingham, in Edgbaston, looking at the car park and going, is that them? Is that looking at all the blokes arriving, thinking, is that going to be my roommate? Well, eventually Andy arrives. Andy's from Matlock in Derbyshire. He liked to drink. He's a top bloke. He lives in Perth now. I'm still in touch with him. Such a, such a good friend. Don't see him very often. But we were invited to the tutor of our floor, his kind of house area in the Hall of Residence that night. And there was alcohol everywhere. The table was literally covered in beer and bottles of wine. And Andy, my new roommate, roommate of only a few hours, tucked in. And I just felt really uncomfortable just being around all these new people. I didn't know how to fit in. And I felt this was potentially an easy way to fit in. So I kind of followed Andy's lead and I began to tuck in. And immediately you feel that comfort in terms of being amongst other people. Suddenly you can have conversations with people that you weren't necessarily comfortable having conversations with before. And that really became the tone of that entire week. Every kind of activity surrounded alcohol. Everything we did. And that wasn't because we were deciding that. It's because it was a very quick way to get rid of those kind of social barriers, that social awkwardness, and get people talking, get people enjoying themselves, and get people comfortable with university life. And I'd say that was the moment in my life that I got a taste for it. But I also understood this, which I think is we'll come on to talk about, became a really destructive thing, is that you've written a book about this. In life, we use masks so often. Even as Christians, we use them. We'll sometimes arrive here at Soul Church and we've had a really tough week and you put on the mask of kind of everything's okay. University, I had to put that mask on in that first week, which was the mask of alcohol. It was masking my nervousness. It was masking my discomfort at not knowing anybody and being a bit rubbish at being away from home and not really knowing how to cook, not really knowing how to wash my clothes and all those kind of things. It put a mask of confidence on. And so it became my kind of go-to mask throughout university. And I kind of had a... I'd say a fairly standard student experience with alcohol. Yeah, at times I drank too much. I didn't drink every night. But when we did get on it, we, we got on it quite big time. But it was never enough to kind of unhinge me from what I was doing in terms of getting a degree. But it became gradually more and more part of life and actually more and more a mask that I would put on to cover how I was really feeling inside. 
Do you think it was in the early day, like a seed, it, you, it, it gone in the ground in those early days, and it was later in life that maybe the fruit of that seed started to, to show? You talk, we talked yeah. again offline about how alcohol changes from your 20s into your 30s. Talk, talk to us a little bit about that shift. <coughs> I, think, I think where it started to become a big problem, or a more significant problem, was when I got the job on Blue Peter back in 1999. I'd gone from wanting to get into television for a long, long time. I'd come out of university at Birmingham, and it'd taken really four years of, of trying, four years of auditions where I got nowhere, to eventually landing this job, and I absolutely loved that job. It was the most incredible, surreal six years of my life that I still look back on. It's quite a while ago now and think I actually did that. You know, I was looking at an article on... Chinook helicopters the other day in the newspaper. Slightly random, I think you'll agree, but I looked at it and thought, I remember abseiling out the back of a Chinook helicopter. I also remember trapping a nerve in my groin as I abseiled at the back of a <laughs> Chinook helicopter, and my scream could be heard above the double rotor blades of a Chinook helicopter, and they had to lower me down onto the turf because I was in so much pain. I digress, but it was a wonderful, wonderful job. But what came with that job, which obviously I knew about when I went into it, was that you were now known by people, whether you liked that or you didn't. I ostensibly loved the job. I'd say, in all honesty, for around about six months, the fame side of thing did interest me. It was a novelty, suddenly people knowing who you were, asking for your autograph, this was the pre-selfie era. So you used to actually scribble on a piece of paper or a napkin in McDonald's. There was no kind of selfies back then. But after a time, that wore off. But what began to happen is I began to feel less and less comfortable in my own skin. I felt very comfortable in front of the camera, which is an odd thing to say for some people. They think, well, if you're uncomfortable just chatting to people like you're doing now, why would you find comfort in front of a camera? But that's where I knew what I was doing. And you kind of do have to put on a persona when you're in front of a camera. I even have to do it on a Saturday because like the other week when I'm really struggling, I can't come on air at midday on Sky Sports 1 or Sky Sports News and say, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Gillette Soccer Saturday. I've had a nightmare of a morning, so this could be a bit of a bumpy ride. <laughs> if you're Tranmere fans, forgive me if I... Forget the fact you're on a terrific run at the moment. You can't. You have to put on a kind of mask. You have to put on a persona and put, off, put on that kind of armor of confidence. And with Blue Peter, I could do that in the studio. But what I struggled with was social settings. Because what I began to do, and I, I firmly believe this is the devil. This is the devil whispering in your ear saying, you cannot be that same person in front of people. They are going to expect you to be the larger-than-life character that they see on the television. And if you're not that person, you are going to be a massive, massive disappointment. And you're going to let people down. They're going to realize you're not who you say you are. You're all a bit of a fraud. And everything that they see on a Monday and a Wednesday and a Friday afternoon on BBC One is fake. And so over time, what I began to do is when I went to award ceremonies, which I hated, if I had to go to a, a, some sort of media do that I absolutely hated, or just went to a friend's party where I'd be meeting new people, I felt that pressure that somehow they expected me to be a certain way. I couldn't really cope with that, the idea that I'd let people down. So drinking became the mask. It would give me my Dutch courage, which I had in bucket loads when I'm in front of a camera, and yet in a social setting, I didn't. I'd want to get out early. I'd want to go home. I didn't really want to be there, unless I was amongst people whom I was friends with. But amongst people I didn't necessarily know, I began to use drink to kind of mask how I was really feeling, to try and be that larger-than-life character. And that ultimately, for me, the thread in terms of alcohol in my life has been that consistent lie that was told to me by the devil right throughout those years where alcohol was a problem, which is you cannot do life without it. You cannot be that confident person without it. You are going to need it to live up to people's expectations. But it is an absolute lie. But for too long, for too long I believed it, and then it begins to get a real grip on your life. Okay, let's fast forward a few years. Obviously, you know, we're not going to go into this tonight, but you suffered the loss of Gemma, your first wife, and um, the grief and the pain that you went through. And obviously, just talk to us about how maybe alcohol played a part in just you really getting so low, into the point where you're thinking, do I even want to be alive? I'd actually given up alcohol when she died back in 2017. And I'd given up a new wine, actually. I had a really firm word from God, which was enough. And so I'd stopped. I think when I look back on it, and I'm sure I'll talk a bit more about this later, is that I'd given up for good reasons. 
but there was still a part of me that hadn't given up for me. I'd actually partly given up for others. And when you do that, it never really ever works. It has to be a decision that comes from your heart and a decision made between you and God, not a decision made for other people. And I think on that occasion, part of it had been made for other people, but I'd stopped drinking kind of mid-August of 2017. And when she died very suddenly in that November, I actually, for the first three weeks, didn't touch a drop. It actually didn't even occur to me. And then the funeral came and went. And it's, it's one of those hardest periods when that moment comes because you're then faced with the actual true reality of what's just happened because there will be that busy period in the lead up to a funeral that kind of occupies your mind a little bit. So the true gravity of what's just happened in terms of your life doesn't really present itself in its truest form until the funeral comes and goes and then people have to go back to work, have to go back to family life. I didn't get left on my own. And I remember the moment so vividly. And I was at home and it was, I think, the day after the funeral. And I just wandered in. We had one or two members of the family over. And I just wandered into the kitchen to get a drink. I think Ribena. The thought had never crossed my mind. And I opened this cupboard. And by this point, the pain's beginning to really hit. And I see a kind of half-drunk, largish bottle of gin that hasn't been touched in ages. I sort of looked at it and thought, no. And I looked at it again. And then that voice that I heard so many times over the next few months, that voice of the devil that prowls around looking to pounce, which was simply this, you're in so much pain, you deserve this. You deserve a break from what you're feeling. And I remember trying to sort of shrug it off and not listen. But again, as I kind of looked in that cupboard, that voice goes, go on, be good to yourself. You deserve this, you deserve this. You deserve to be freed from your pain for a while. And I just remember looking into the kind of reflection of the kitchen window because I could see into the lounge that no one was looking. So already the deception has begun. And I just grabbed it. I poured quite a large measure into a glass, added Ribena. It's not a great mix, by the way. <laughs> and potted back to the lounge. And I just remember as that alcohol hit my tongue and then hit my system for the first time, there was that instant release from what I was feeling. But of course, as I found out over the next months, it was only ever temporary. And that's the lie of what I was being told. It was only ever temporary. For a little while, for maybe an hour, for maybe two, it would free you from that sense of fear. It would free you from that horrible loneliness, both physical and emotional, that you feel after the loss of a loved one. But it would only last a few moments. And then the pattern was always the same. It was a descent into a really dark and dangerous place, a place where all kinds of thoughts come into your mind about whether you really want to be here anymore, whether or not you have the strength to walk the path ahead that at that point in life, myself and Ethan had to walk. And so that became my go-to thing. And, you know, for Steve and his family, they'll, they'll probably know this deep down. And for you guys, for any of you here who've been through something really tough in life, whether it is loss, whether it is mental health problems, whether it, whatever it might be, the hardest truth in all of this but the greatest truth, one is that God will walk with you and he will stand by your side. He will walk with you every single yard of that journey. Sometimes you won't know he's there. Sometimes you won't feel there. But at some point, in order to heal, in order to be restored, in order to gain strength again, you have to sit in the pain. And it's a horrible place to be. And it's a really hard place to be. But the great and glorious truth is God sits with you in that pain and in that place, and he knows exactly what it's like because he's sat in that place as well. The alcohol became the putting off of that. I, I don't want to feel the loneliness. I don't want to feel this pain anymore, so I'm going to drink it away. And very sadly, that became a daily battle for me every single day for weeks on end. I call it the co-op moment when I was going to get, and I say this with, with no pride or anything, and actually a sense of shame, but God says I don't need to feel shame about this anymore because it's done. But it does bring that sense of shame of, of going to pick him up from school. I used to call it the co-op moment. If I could get past the co-op to pick him up from school and not go into the co-op and buy something I knew I shouldn't be buying, then I was okay for the rest of the day. Because Ethan was getting to an age where he was beginning to understand what was happening with his dad. He was beginning to understand the change in me in the evenings. And that's been a painful journey, dealing with the... The guilt I feel about that, you know, at times, but, but God has freed me from that. But I had to get through that moment every single day. 
and some days I could beat it, other days I just hung a left and went straight in there and hoped that no one from the neighbor who knew me would see me in there buying another bottle of spirit. But that battle was real for days on end, for weeks on end, for months on end actually. And it took me to the very precipice on more than one occasion. And I'm so thankful that all throughout that, somehow, somehow I held on, but God never ever let go. Amen. Never ever let go. But Amen. it's been a harsh lesson that, that sadly, when you go through something rough, in order to come through it, in order for God to restore you through it, you're going to have to go through the pain. And you're going to actually have to feel the pain. And too often in life, we go, actually, I don't fancy that. And too often in life, alcohol becomes the self-medication that suspends that. But it's a lie. It's a lie because it, it will not bring healing. It actually takes you to the precipice, well, certainly with me, of destruction. I think we're all stirred by your honesty and your transparency tonight, Simon, and we thank you for that. Okay. So then you've, you've gone through this, you've been right to the edge, and then you've, there's, been a, there's been a point where you've said, I've got to change. This point where I cannot go on. What is, tell us about that moment and then this, this decision to live a life of sobriety. So that battle carried on, but it became a lot less intense. But it never truly went away. And really, my trigger point was always stress. So whether it was stress in my relationship, stress with home life, stress with not finding work, whatever it might be, my, my go-to kind of coping strategy was, was still alcohol. It wasn't as much, but it was still the place I would go. And I got married to Dorina a couple of years ago, not too far from here in Oxnead Hall. We were lucky enough to get married in the cathedral. We actually passed it today. We saw it in the distance. Thought, I can't believe we got married there. Thanks to you putting me in touch with the right person at the cathedral. And because my dad was a vicar in Norwich, we got married in the cathedral. Massive. I digress again. But drink was still part of my wedding day and drink was still part of the first part of married life. And I don't think Doreen will mind me saying this, but she was becoming increasingly worried. She was becoming increasingly fearful about what this might mean for our relationship going forward. Could she stand by a man who was actively trying at some points to almost destroy what he had? And I remember this conversation I had with a mate of mine called Carl Beach, who I think I've mentioned before, but he is an amazing Christian guy, he runs Christian Vision for Men, or at least did. And Carl had begun this Christian leadership group on Facebook called Sober Leader. It's a closed group, so it's only, you know, membership by invitation. And it's a group that's been created to allow Christians, particularly ones in leadership roles, to have really open and honest and non-judged conversations about their relationship with alcohol. And on that group, and it's been an amazing group, are men and women, some of whom have been sober for 10, 15, 20 years, some have only just become sober, and some are still thinking about it and working out what is the best way forward for them in terms of their relationship with alcohol. And I had a few conversations with Carl, and this one phrase kept coming back to me again and again and again that Carl talked about in terms of him, and he really didn't have a booze problem, not as I would term as a booze problem, but he wanted to be, and this was the phrase, the best version of himself. In order for him to be the best evangelist, which he is, he can be. In order him, for him to be the best leader, he possibly can be. To have Jesus right at the heart of everything he does and to be the very best Jesus-shaped version of himself, he realized that for him, alcohol could play no point in that. And so I was having conversations with him in December, the year before last, and that phrase kept coming back to me again and again and again, being the best version of myself. And asking myself the tough question, can I be the best witness to God if I carry on drinking? Can I be the best husband to Dorina I possibly can be if I carry on drinking? Can I be the best father to Ethan, Talitha hadn't arrived at this point, if I'm still drinking? Can I be the best brother? Can I be the best son? Can I be the best friend? And actually, can I be the best at what I do in terms of my career with alcohol? And the answer to every single one of those questions was a resounding no. And so at the start of last year, we've gone into January, I didn't do the predictable 
on the stroke of midnight New Year's Eve. I just woke up one morning and I thought, that is it. And that is the date. So I did get a tattoo. Torina wasn't too sure about it at first, but actually I wanted something visual to remind me of that day of the 5th of January, 2022. And I've been reliably told and proven by Mr. Steve Morstan. I was asking around, give me, give me the Hebrew word for sobriety. And Steve came back to me with these amazing theological notes and said, well, there isn't quite the Hebrew word in the New Testament, but there is the Greek New Testament word for sobriety, and that's it <laughs> written underneath. And so that was the date in which everything changed. But the reason it changed on that day, John, is because this time it was me. It was a selfish decision between myself and God just going, I've come now far enough. In order for all these things to change, I can't be doing it to please Darina. I can't be doing it to not worry Ethan. I can't be doing it to keep my friends happy. I have to do it for myself. And then out of that decision, all of those other things will be blessed. Okay, let's talk about the reaction of people. Let's talk about the reaction of Christians to that decision. We had, a, again, an interesting conversation um, around people's reaction to you being you know, a, li a lifetime sober. The reactions of others is, is, I've always found intriguing and quite wide in, in how people kind of accept it. I, I do honestly believe that the conversation, which is why I think it's really important that church is having this conversation, because they're having it out there in the secular world. There is a growing movement, whether you know about it or you don't, of young people, the people of my age as well, who are just realizing what a poison, what a drug, and what a handbrake on their lives alcohol is. And so it's really important that we're having these conversations within churches because for too long it's been something that we've kind of parked to one side. But and it's on. really interesting. Why yeah. is the church so afraid of this conversation? Do you know why? Because I think there's a lot of shame that surrounds drinking. I think there's a lot of that shame I talked about earlier. We are worried that if we pipe up and say within our Christian settings, whether it's in a home group that we're meeting in, whether it's amongst friends on a Sunday, amongst friends socially from church we're out with, is that fear of condemnation. Because it isn't something that's spoken about an awful lot within churches. There is that fear that if I put my head above the parapet and say, hey guys, I, I'm, I struggle. I actually struggle with the booze. I'm not proud of it, but I struggle with it. We fear condemnation. We fear the absolute antithesis in terms of reaction to what the reaction of Jesus is. The reaction of Jesus isn't one of condemnation. It isn't one of judgment. It is one of love, it is one of grace, and it's one of forgiveness. And I, I think the saddest thing that comes out of that group that I'm on, I haven't felt it this time, I have felt it in the past. One of the things that is often said within that Facebook group amongst Christian leaders is some of the most adverse reactions, some of the most argumentative reactions, some of the most strongly anti the decision they've made reactions, has all come from Christians. It's come from other Christian leaders. It's come from people within their own church who find it an affront, the fact they've decided to stop drinking. And I think I know why this is, because uh, I've seen it myself with, with reactions to me, but I've also seen it from non-Christians as well, is that without meaning to, and that's why I hope this conversation tonight doesn't sound legalistic, doesn't sound judgmental, just trying to have an open, honest conversation about alcohol and not wanting anyone to leave here tonight feeling a sense of shame or feeling a sense they're being judged because that's not the God I follow. That is not the God I follow. But on this group, they talk about that reaction. And I think why we sometimes see it is because without meaning to, when you say I don't drink, you hold this invisible mirror up in front of that person. And in that mirror, they see a version of themselves they probably deep down don't like. The version that I saw of myself, when I'd look in the actual mirror the next morning after a big night out and think, I don't like this version of myself. I don't want to be looking like this anymore. I don't want my face to look red and ruddy, and my eyes to look constantly tired anymore. And it's almost like your decision to turn your back on something that you know for you has been a really negative influence. It's a reminder to them that actually maybe, maybe for them, they've got to sort this out. And so their reaction tends to be one of aggression. Why have you done that? Why, why have you given it up? What do you, what do you do? Why do you need to do that? And it's like question after question after question after question. 
And that strongest reaction I've tended to see with Christians and not non-Christians, which is when you think about it, and when you think about the God that we follow, is a very upside-down version of faith. Wow. How do people recognize that this is a struggle? Because often you, you, you had the courage to recognize that this was an issue, but often oh, it's just a beer or it's just a drink or it's just two glasses of wine. How do you know where that line is for people? When, where, where does the line change? It is, it's a really it's a, it's a tough question, this one. And yeah, one of the things that myself and John wanted tonight to be was wasn't kind of banging people over the head with a kind of anti-alcohol message. It's really not that. It's about opening up a conversation amongst each other to realize that for some of us in this room, we struggle with alcohol. For some of us in this room, we have a very easy relationship with alcohol where we're a bit like the 18-year-old version of myself where we can just have a drink, we enjoy it with a meal, but it's nothing more, never has been and probably never will. But there's others in this room for whom that off button, that off switch isn't always very easy to find. I was one of those people. I'm a kind of all or nothing personality, which in so many areas of my life, particularly when it's come to my career, has been a massive, massive help. It means you can jump out of a Chinook and injure your groin. You just go for it. But it played out really badly when it came to alcohol because it didn't have an off switch. And I think, I think the best way to discover where your relationship with alcohol is, is to have really honest conversations with God. Because when you invite God into your life and you come into his presence, just his very presence tends to shine a light on those areas of our life that we know are not right. And sometimes you've got to be honest enough to say to God, you know, show me, reveal to me those areas in my life that you know right now do not sit well in terms of our relationship. But I think ultimately, for quite a number of us, we will know that it's an issue. We will have those times. You know, if, if after a night of drinking or a day of drinking, regret is one of those feelings you wake up with in the morning, then your relationship with alcohol probably isn't a brilliant one. If you wake up in the morning with a sense of kind of just being very down in terms of emotionally and mentally, again, your relationship with alcohol probably isn't a good one. But we have to recognize, and this is why the church's voice in this area is so important, is that alcohol is entwined into the fabric of our nation. You look everywhere, and it's part of our nation. If you go to a wedding, one of the biggest conversations you'll have with your fiancé after you've booked the venue will be, how much drink? What are we going to buy? What are we going to get in? Do we do a free bar? Do we not do a free bar? What kind of drinks will we have on the table? We don't want the drink to run out. That's the biggest fear at a wedding. Do not let the drink run out. If the food's a little bit average, that's a bit of a blow. But if the booze run out, that is a massive blow. Baptisms, wakes, conversations often about what drinks are we going to provide? Leaving university, graduating, celebrating exam success often goes hand in hand with alcohol. Sports, the, in, the world in which I inhabit, absolutely entwined in terms of alcohol. I remember Gary Neville saying this. He went out to do a documentary ahead of the World Cup in Qatar where drink was going to be much, much harder to get hold of. And he said, when it comes to England fans and football and alcohol, they go hand in hand. Sir Clive Woodward, when talking about the Six Nations at Twickenham this year, said Twickenham has become like one large stag do. I remember going to the cricket many times, and the biggest conversation with the lads ahead of a terrific day at the Oval watching the Ashes was how much alcohol are we allowed to take into the ground? How much are you allowed in, and then how much are we going to end up spending? It's entwined in our culture. And so everywhere we look and turn in terms of social occasions, alcohol is so often going to be there. But I think coming back to your question, if you feel that certain discomfort about it, if you feel that sense of regret, if you know emotionally and mentally it's driving you to a dark place, then you probably haven't got a very healthy relationship with it. And maybe it is about time, and I think we should talk about this, that you begin to find someone you can talk to and begin to share. This is something you must never, ever struggle with alone. Brilliant, brilliant. We've had a text in. Someone's asked, how do you put guardrails in this area? So what are some of the guardrails that you've put up now that you're sober? Obviously, maybe certain environments. And, I've, got a I've got a tattoo, 
Dorina initially said, stick it, on your, stick it on your bicep. But the whole point of it was that if ever that hand, I'm right-handed when it comes to drinking, went towards a glass, there it is. I didn't want to be one of those guys. You, you occasionally see them now. I saw them a lot when I was young. Had old ex-girlfriends' names crossed out in tattoos. Not a good look. I thought, that's not one I want crossed out. So that is a powerful reminder. You Alan's know, got that. What's that? Alan's got that. <laughs> <laughs> you went... You didn't go for the barbed wire, did you? <laughs> nice on the back, is on it? On his back. <laughs> They're behind him. But it's, it's also being, being aware. I, you know, I did note down some verses that I find you know, very helpful. I mean, John 10, verse 10, the thief comes only to steal and destroy. I have come that they may have life and life to the full. Ephesians 5, verse 15 says, be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk in wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the spirit. And I, I think for me, it's being about being spiritually switched on. And I'm really, really grateful to God that actually the time I ever think about alcohol is minute. The, the thought of it actually grabbing another drink has gone across my mind seriously about four times in the last 20 months. But coming back to the question and just picking up on what I was saying before, I'd say a really helpful thing when it comes to this area is accountability. I'd say if you can, and maybe use the leadership team here to, to find someone, but maybe find someone that it needs to be someone you trust, obviously, a friend, someone from this church, but someone you can be accountable with. And what I mean by accountability, it's saying to someone, look, this is an area that I struggle with. And I, I had this. I had two people I was accountable to when I gave up alcohol the first time. And I'll tell you why it didn't work and how it does work. But it's about just having a trust with someone that they can ask you those tough questions. How is it going with the drinking this week? It's essentially giving someone permission to ask the difficult questions. And just having someone who will regularly check in, not in the language of judgment and condemnation, but the language of love and say, how are you doing this week? Now, this is an example of where it didn't go well. So I had a friend, I'm not going to say his name, it wouldn't be fair on him. I had two friends I was accountable to. One, it worked really well. The other one, it didn't. The one it worked really well with did it through the language of love. So he would just get alongside me every now and again, I'd see him, and he'd just come up to me and say, Si, how's it going with the drinking? Very simple. And it kind of made me drop my guard immediately, because there was no kind of accusatory tone in what he said. It was just, how, how, how are things going? How are you doing at the moment? And I'd be able to open up to him. I remember my other friend I was accountable to, it was a very different language. I remember in the May of 2018, so a few months after Gemma had died, myself and Ethan went out in the camper van that I'd got on loan for a week to do our first holiday together. So a huge moment, a moment I was very nervous about. How would this work? How would I feel? How would he feel? And off we went down to the South Coast. And it was a lovely Saturday. And the sun was shining, not quite as warm as today. But just for the fleeting, fleeting of moments, I felt this sense that maybe things eventually might be all right. The sun was on my back. For a moment, I felt good. I thought, maybe life can be good again. And then I get a text from my mate who I was accountable to. And it was just, I know things can get lost in text messages. So if you're going to do accountability, do it face-to-face -face or at least voice-to-voice -voice down the phone. Don't do text messages. And it just said, I know you're away this week. What's going on with the drinking? And it got my back up. It got my back up. I, I suddenly became full of anger. One moment ago, I'm feeling a sense of goodness and, and like a brief momentary respite from everything that's going on. But now my friend has clanged in with that, what sounded like judgment, and it got my back up, it filled me with anger, and that relationship never, ever worked. So I would encourage you to find someone you could be accountable to. And if you are the person who is being asked to be accountable to, as in you are the one who's gonna ask those difficult questions, it's essentially you saying to that person, I give you permission to ask the difficult questions. But as part of that, as you, the one asking those difficult questions, you ask them in the language of Jesus, which is not the language of condemnation. It's not the language of judgment. It's not the language that makes that person feel awful. It's the language of love that, yes, will still shine a light on difficult areas. But when it comes from a place of love, it's a conversation changer. And it's actually a life changer. Yeah. So my, my biggest encouragement would be find someone you trust and be accountable to them. Get someone to journey with you. God will definitely journey with you throughout the whole thing. But get someone to walk alongside you as well.
Amazing. All right, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna bring this down to a close. Just before we do, we've had a lot of parents texting in, saying I need help with my kids. Do I drink in front of my children, my young people? I'm kind of journeying this at home, and a lot of parents, especially as you've just said, we, everything is just alcohol everywhere, advertising, television. How can we help parents here this evening? I think well, the most important thing you can do as a parent um, is model love. And if you are modeling something else, because you change when you drink, then you're no longer modeling what I would call godly love within your home. I, I think back to a wedding I went to a while ago, and I think it was the second wedding I've been to where I didn't drink. It's, it's amazing how strong your antenna is for when people have had a drink or two. And I remember chatting to one of the, um, the groomsmen at the start of the day. It was about 11 o'clock, beautiful sunny day. And he's a lovely Scottish chap. He had his big kilt on sort of larger-than-life character, but a really lovely guy. It's not that he became unlovely later. And I bumped into him again at about 11 o'clock that night, and the change, it was like someone had taken this bloke over. He comes bounding over to me in a bar, wraps his huge Glaswegian arms around me, and starts accusing me of supplying arms to the Russians. It was the <laughs> most bizarre conversation I've had in a long time. But it, it was like this guy had become someone totally different to the one that I'd met 10 hours ago. Why? Because he'd had a skin full. He'd become a completely different person. And I, I feel as someone who's been there in terms of drinking, I tried to do it in secret, but as I said, as Ethan got older, he became more switched on to what his dad was doing a few years back. You know, I feel so much regret. I know God has freed me from that, but at that sense, I wish, I wish I could go back and change that. I wish Ethan didn't have that memory of what happened in that period. But I know that the longer we go on on this journey, the, the longer that I go on in the journey of sobriety, which by the way, because I don't want to forget to say this, it has been the single best decision alongside, alongside deciding to follow Jesus that I've ever made in my entire life. It has been wonderfully <laughs> liberating. You know, so often we feel when we give up stuff that it's just going to be dull, that it's going to be boring, that life's never going to be the same again, and weddings and social occasions are just going to be really, really beige. It's been amazingly liberating. Life is, for me, so much better without it. But for parents, all I'll say is this. That behavior that I talked about from a few years ago is something I never, ever want to model again in front of Ethan and in front of Talitha. I don't want to model that in front of my wife. I don't want to model that in front of my family. I don't want to model that in front of my friends. And so what I would say to parents is this. Model something godly at home in terms of your relationship with alcohol. And I'd go as far as saying, you know, if, if you know that one maybe leads to another and leads to another, don't put yourself in a situation where your children begin to see that change in you. Maybe not the change quite as big as the Glaswegian groomsman but they begin to see changes in you and maybe arguments erupt that maybe wouldn't have erupted before. God wants the best for us. He wants the best for our lives. He wants the best for us as parents. So model something godly. And if that means drinking when the kids have gone to bed, then maybe leave it till then, but model something positive. And I think it comes back to what we said earlier. If you know deep down, this is an area you struggle with. This is an area that's been a negative in your life. Don't bring that into the family home. Don't bring that into the family home. Simon Thomas. Thank you. Come on, let's put our hands together. Thanks, mate. That was brilliant. Just before Simon jumps down, did everybody get some from that tonight? Yeah, I, I think that was a really, I, I gleaned a lot. I thought it was a really helpful conversation for our church. As a church, we're not going to tell people what to do. We, we want you guys to kind of work this thing through for yourselves, for your family, for your children. But we want to see people walking in freedom. And uh, Simon, you've had the courage to share your journey tonight. And I know I got you to pray earlier, but I'd love you just to pray one more time. Then Matt, Matt's going to jump up and he's going to talk to us about just some practical next steps for the church. If we, if we need some more information or help and support around this. So, but would, would you pray? And let's just close our eyes. This is a private, private time. Holy Spirit, come. 
Father God, I thank you that tonight in this place we've been able to have this conversation. I thank you for the freedom that you bring when we have conversations like this, that when we bring things into the light, then healing begins and restoration begins. And I pray particularly for anyone in this room tonight for whom this area has been a struggle. I pray, Lord, that you would bring freedom into their lives in the same way that you brought freedom into mine over the last year and a half. I pray that tonight might be a turning point. It might be the journey to a new kind of faith, a new kind of liberation from old patterns of behavior, old rituals that we know bind us down. We still hold on to you, but we get bound down by things that we know are negative and destructive. I pray for freedom to come into those lives tonight. I pray that they would find the right people to get alongside them. And I pray that when we have these difficult conversations, whether it's around this area or other areas in life, that there would never ever be a shred of condemnation in the conversations we have. I pray that people would never feel that sense of shame, but instead that feeling of your all-encompassing grace and love and forgiveness because God you're not a God who says don't do this all the time you're a God who says I want the best for you so maybe maybe this isn't the best for you and I pray that not just in this church but in churches across our nation this would be something that we feel a sense of freedom to talk about that this wouldn't any longer be referred to as a taboo subject that there would no longer be any shame about people standing up and saying, I've got an issue with this and I need help. I pray that there would be a freedom. And I pray ultimately, Lord, that if we know that this is an area of life where in terms of our faith and in terms of our witness, we lose our saltiness, that light is dimmed, then I pray tonight that we would do something about it, that we would regain that saltiness, that we would regain that bright light and begin to walk again free from those things that seem to bring us down and to bind us. Amen. 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 Thanks, Simon.